Hello, everybody. Welcome to another textile talk. Um, I'm Martha Seelman. I'm the executive director of Studio Art Quilt Associates. I'm really excited because there's almost 700 of us here together today to talk about art quilts. Um, before we get started, I want to suggest that you might want to go over to sakwa.com, S-A-Q-A.com slash trunk show, because we just finished a three-year run of some small uh, pieces made by our members, and because we're now finished with this exhibition, um, they're for sale. So if you'd like something to cheer up your uh, your day, your week, your month, um, go on over to saqa.com slash trunk show and see all of the wonderful small pieces of art that are for sale there. Today's trunk show um, is brought to you by, I mean, not trunk show, today's textile talk is brought to you by our generous sponsors. We produce textile talks um, every week. SAQWA is one of six organizations that puts these on, but we would not be able to do it without the generous support of these sponsors. And we hope that you'll let them know how much you appreciate Textile Talks because they're the ones who are paying for us to be able to have the Zoom platform, to be able to contact you um, by email to let you know when there's a new Textile Talk coming up to fund all of the costs that go into making this happen. Today, what we're going to share with you are art from one of Sakwa's exhibitions. This one's called Upcycle. Sakwa has a wonderful committee of volunteers who make up our exhibition committee. And it's their job to come up with themes for our exhibitions. And um, in any given year, Sakwa travels about 12 to 15 different global exhibitions to different venues around the planet. Um, and the exhibition committee works hard to come up with a wide variety of themes that they can in, um, inspire our artist members to contribute to and that audiences will enjoy when they go to see them at the different venues. Upcycle came out of concerns about the environment interests from our artist members in reusing and recycling and upcycling materials. And um, while well, I'm not supposed to have favorites, it's one of my favorite exhibitions because I think that it really showcases the amazing creativity that our artists have so that they can look at something that most of us would just toss in the trash and say, there's potential here. This could be upcycled into a piece of glorious artwork. So there's three artists who are going to be talking to you live today. But as we've been doing these the textile talks, one of the things that we've been struggling with is how to involve our artists who live in Australia and New Zealand and Japan. and involve them in textile talks, given that for them, this time of the day is the middle of the night. It's just not feasible. So this time we're experimenting. We um, were able to record a presentation by Beth and Trevor Reed, who live in Australia. And so we'll be sharing that recording with you before we get into the live presentations. Hello, everybody. I'm glad you're rejoining. We have no idea what happened. Uh, <laughs> uh, we all got booted off, um, but it looks like almost everybody is back. Um, and uh, we're going to wait just one more minute, get everybody really back on. And then we really will start meeting the artists. We're going to hear from Beth and Trevor Reed. And um, they will then be hearing from Carol Larson, Linda Severson Guild, and Laura Wazalowski, who are all uh, artists in Upcycle. 
Um, it looks like we are all here. Um, so sorry about that to everybody. Zoom kicked us all off, no idea why, um, but we are now back on. And um, let's start with hearing from Beth and Trevor Reed. Thank you. Hi, I'm Trevor. And I'm uh, Beth Reed, and we live in um, Gowrie, ACT, which is the capital of Australia. Um, we have been quilting together since 1988, but collaborating from what? 98 onwards? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. yes. So the first, uh, first slide was to show you is a, a quilt called Hot Lava. Uh, this was part of a, a quite a, a series of quilts. Uh, this was the first two panels of that, which actually was seven uh, panels. Uh, this uh, is about the hot lava vases that came out of West Germany um, after the war. And uh, with this uh, quilt, we actually won the best of show for the ACT or the Australian Capital Territory. So. That's um, quite a, a sizable piece, that. And the fabrics at the bottom are all from our stash. And the top part is actually hand painted by me uh, with uh, uh, dyes. And then uh, Beth does all the machine quilting. And this is one of the first quilts that we ever did that um, is hand painted. Um, it, it was the start of our sort of painting period. Now this, uh, the ACT or Canberra the, uh, in the ACT uh, is, is only a short uh, lived um, capital city. It's only a hundred, just over a hundred years old. So this happened in 2013. And um, so this was part of an exhibition that was staged where the group tactile that we belong to, there's five artists, actually six artists, but Beth and I worked collaboratively. And we decided to do 100 quilts for the 100 years. And we submitted this uh, proposal and we were accepted to, to make this uh, the exhibition. So this is our 20 pieces uh, that we made. That's correct. Each artist had to do 20 pieces, which made 100 in total. And these are, based on Walter Burley Griffin's plan of Canberra. Um, you can see from the backgrounds that it's a streetscape and the leaves refer to the bush capital. Canberra is always referred to as the bush capital. Walter Burley Griffin and Marion Marnie Griffin, uh, when they did the designs for Canberra, had great tracks of natural landscape running through the design. And uh, you can see this in these pieces where there is, there's uh, streets, but, but also spaces uh, left. And the, the gum tree or the eucalypts uh, are the predominant in the, in the landscape. Now this one leaf bed is 2015. This started out to be a sort of a, a follow on from that leaf uh, designs. And I hand painted each one of these leaves. Um, we then uh, layered them together. And then we, uh, Beth actually uh, machine sewed them and quilted them and we cut them out. Each leaf is a little quilt in its own. Um, each one is individual. Now this started out to be a double bed size quilt. As you can see, it's only 70 by 70 centimetres. We gave up after about three months. And the quilt references the, the leaf litter underneath the trees um, that you see around Canberra. Degree of difference. Now this quilt was the very first one that we started using circles in. Um, it is uh, a machine pieced in strips and originally the strips were squares, but we lost the square look by all the, the colourway and colour wash in the, um, in the background fabrics. The circles Trevor hand painted and I machine quilted. 
and it is um, a reference to our fabric collection again and was in response to a um, call for entries for an e exhibition in Sydney in 2015. So the graduation of colour is, is something that becomes a part of our theme as well, as you will see with uh, the next few slides. So this um, going in tonal values and through colour changes uh, becomes a quite a pattern in some of our quilting today. Yeah, and I like the way the circles dance across the top of the quilt. It looks really nice. Okay, so with this one, as you can see, the bottom part of this um, is once again stash. Uh, this is where we've taken um, lots of fabrics in a certain colour ways. Um, and the little oyster catchers, um, are represented as being on the shoreline with the, with the dusty sort of sky in the background. Uh, this was actually a, a piece that we did for workshops and uh, all the little birds are actually hand painted uh, onto the, um, the back, background fabric. So uh, very similar to the hot lava one where we've we've made up the, the, the base of the quilt with uh, stash little tiny pieces. Now, as you can see, these are quite small, these pieces as well. Now the pieces in the bottom are um, inch squares. So you can get an idea of um, size. the size of the quilt. And Trevor and I, although um, can, um, Australia is a, a meters and centimeters, being children of the, we were born in the 40s um, or late 40s, um, we grew up with inches. So we tend to work in inches rather than in centimetres. Which is always interesting when uh, an exhibition calls for centimetres and we have to sort of, you know, work around that. So. <laughs> now you can see that I wear glasses, um, but um, I only need those for, for close up work. Um, I developed cataracts, and this is about that blurring of the my eyesight. So the uh, spots here have become sort of quite predominant in our work at this particular time. And once again, you can see that tonal values uh, thing coming coming through the work as well. This was purely from our stash, um, and. Um, yeah, so what have you got to say about this one? <laughs> Nothing much, it's Nothing. just that I like it and it won Best of Show in 2018 in Canberra, which was really nice. And I really like the way the colours dance in this quilt with the dark on the outside going right into the sort of the, the light colours in the middle. Even though the, the centre is, is quite pale, it, it's still quite vibrant with the, with the colours. And here we come to denim. So um, we tend to have one of those households where we never throw anything out. And our, our son, who is now in his uh, late forties, um, loved his denim jeans and he particularly wore rather large, big baggy jeans. And so he was very fond of these jeans and hated the idea of throwing them out. So they got put away in a box and then we, one day we decided, let's start playing with denim. So here we've taken that same theme as the last quilt, uh, but we've actually working in denim. And just those, all of these are just the natural colors within the denim jeans that we had. Today we have these sort of artificially sort of, you know, blonded knees and so forth in jeans. And we tend to work with those sort of things as, as well. So this one is, as you can see, is only 50 by 50 centimetres. So quite, quite small. And working with those tonal values at this sort of size um, is, it, you think it's simple, but believe me, it takes a lot, of, a lot of effort and a lot of uh, changing around of, of pieces to get the, the effect. Now, here we have Moody Blues 2019. Uh, this is for the exhibition Upcycle, uh, which this is all about. So this is the quilt that is in the exhibition. So as you can see, once again, it's denim upcycling those jeans, 
making you know, use of, of something that you know, would have been thrown out. Um, and this is all the natural colors of those genes as they, you know, as they were up, uh, after being used for many years. Some of these fabrics are so soft and, and, and pliable. They're just beautiful to work with. And you can see with some of the circles, there's almost a 3D effect. And that's purely with that um, faded parts of the genes making use of those parts. And also there's um, use being made of the way the grain goes on these circles. So I'm not sure you can see it in this photo, but the grains go um, in different ways, promoting um, light falling in different ways, I guess, on the way the circles sit in the square. We've done workshops where we've done something that looks as simple as this and, and people go, oh yes, I'll do that workshop because it's simple. And then once you get into it, you realize just how complex the whole process is to, to get the effects that you, you really want within the, the piece. So that, there I you go. That might be it. That's, uh, yeah, that's us from down here in lovely, you know, Australia. <laughs> so uh, thank you. Thank you, Beth and Trevor. Um, I've been capturing all your questions. We'll share them with Beth and Trevor. A couple people asked the same question, so I wanted to just respond to it. What we ask that all of our artists to do for this presentation is to talk about all of the work that they make, as well as the particular piece that is in the Sakwa exhibition upcycle, which for Beth and Trevor was that last piece they showed upcycled from the collection of their son's blue jeans. And now I'm delighted to turn it over to Carol Larson, who will be talking about her work. They made it look so easy. Um, I'd like to thank Sakwa first for the opportunity to share my work today. Uh, next. Uh, this is the work in Upcycle, Keeping Up Appearances 4. Like many girls of my generation, my childhood was orchestrated by Miss Amy Vanderbilt and her book of Complete Etiquette. The series of Keeping Up Appearances tackles some of the thornier social issues of mid-century America, inspired by a text from this 1954 book. Each piece in the series incorporates heirloom linens, which have been dye painted and screen printed. Next. The text is copied from Amy Vanderbilt's Complete Book of Etiquette and is used with permission by Lincoln G. Clark, trustee of the Amy Vanderbilt Keller Literary, Literary Property Trust. He said his mother would be so honored to see her life's work so beautifully used in my art. I neglected to mention that the work was a parody. Next. Upheaval 7, the challenges of an elder parent with dementia brought chaos, crisis, and disruption into my otherwise centered life. Years of therapy were tested by frequent interactions with extended family members. This upheaval and chaos manifested as a new shape for my work. Next. The Defining Moment series was a joint project between the late Marianne Coleman and myself through exploration of our vastly different upbringing and experiences, she of the Jim Crow era in West Texas and my white privilege upraising in suburban San Francisco, we created an important and culturally relevant exhibit of our defining moments that led us to becoming good friends and aging women despite our many differences. This work, Defining Moments 12, No Means No, is the story of my 1967 campus rape printed to cloth. The slash represents how this assault disrupted my sense of personal safety and well being. Next, fire and flood. I've actually made three of these, so this is the second one. A decade of drought brought a horrific wildfire season, where at one point there were over 20 actively burning wildfires in the state. Shortly thereafter, a normal wildfire, wildfire, a normal rainfall season followed, bringing heavy rain. All too soon, the river flooded, 
washing out some of those who had just escaped the fires. I was struck by the irony of too little water and too much water, all within just four months time. Next. In this work, I researched the reasons why gun owners cherish their weapons. We most frequently hear it's my second amendment right. Yet I was curious as to other reasons. Responses varied from bear protection in Alaska to killing rattlesnakes in Texas, to protecting a schoolyard full of kids, to doubting one's ability to provide or even to be a hero. I compiled a list of reasons, digitally manipulated the text, which was commercially printed to whole cloth. Red textile paint and black hand stitches represent the bloodshed caused by a culture of fear. Next. This detail is from my first piece on Black Lives Matter. This is the center section which reflects the digitally printed names of 76 black lives extinguished by asphyxiation or police restraint between 2000 and 2020. The surrounding names are but a minute percentage of the over 4,700 black people killed by gunfire in encounters with police in just this century. I titled this work, Somebody's Child, as all of these folks had a mama. This piece is currently touring in the Women of Color Quilters Network exhibit, We Are the Story, curated by Dr. Carolyn Maslumi. Next. In 2019, the Southern Poverty Law Center tracked 940 hate groups in the United States. Sadly, the, names, the numbers have only increased since then. No one is born a hater. Hate is a learned behavior. Why can they not instead learn to love rather than hate? The title and quantity of the US-based hate groups are printed to the background. Quotes from love songs and poetry are screen printed on top in white and again in red onto a vintage lace tablecloth. The mosaic of the heart covering the hate groups is my op optimistic wish for our nation's healing. Next. So we've lived in this house for 46 years and I have managed to take over most of it for my artwork. Um, I have a custom dry studio upstairs with um, where my husband has built in all the shelving for storing my cloth and my sewing machines. And then in my office, I have a mid-arm, a sit-down uh, jukey mid-arm on a six-foot table just opposite where I'm sitting. And in the basement, I have um, a wet studio with a new sink because I trashed the old one and a, a photo area. And here's Linda. Thank you, Carol. Um, I see my picture, but I don't see me. Thank you as well to the leadership that has made these talk, textile talks possible. My name is Linda Severson Guild and I live in Bethesda, Maryland. I am honored to have... Can anybody see anything here? We're good, Linda. We see you and hear you, Linda. Go ahead. Well, I, okay, I don't see any pictures, so that's what I was asking. I am honored to have points of entree included in the Sakwa exhibition, Upcycle. Entree is defined as the act or manner of entering with a nod to access or freedom. How often is permission granted to enter from the Statue of Liberty to doors and windows and every garment we wear? There is always a story or might we, may, we might say history linked to anything that has been upcycled. This quilt began as unrelated assemblies that agreed to work together. The base fabric for the dark portions is a shattered silk that came from an obi I found at an estate sale. The width of the silk determined the width of the individual panels in points of entree. I love finding inspiration in unusual places such as the key stitched or hanging on the surface. Each possesses the intention to unlock physical or emotional doors. Finally, consider two of the sentiments captured in a line of fortunes that have been hand-stitched this quilt. Education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. And a handful of patience is worth more 
than a bushel of brains. This piece was intended to encourage the viewer to consider how many different ways we enter life. I am an architect by training. Next, my allegiance to an awareness of the world surrounding us is reflected in the following slides. Details of points of entree will sit on the right side of your screen, while the left side will share projects that contributed to or grew from the ideas captured in points of entree. This piece is called In Service to, to the Public. It is um, a collection of four public buildings from my hometown that um, all of one, which all except one, the public library, are still in uh, public use. Um, it's a collage in a manner similar to what Points of Entree does. They both use layers and proportion that overlap one another to weave the texture of the bricks and the bricks together. If you look at this, you'll see what I'm talking about on the left, whereas there's a detail of comparison on the right in each of the following pictures. My goal when building this piece was to bring a renewed awareness of architecture into the mainstream of thought in my hometown, which was devastated by seven tornadoes that damaged and destroyed buildings and the creative heart of the community in June of 1980. The following two pieces are also part of the series of nine quilts focusing on the concept, concept rather than, or upcycle rather than destroy. Next. South Locust presents one of the oldest parts of town, including historic buildings, one house from a street that used to be lined with Christmas lights each December, a stone wall you pass as you enter Pier Park and the Statue of Liberty in the park donated by the Boy Scouts. My version of the statue is composed of seven shades of brown under all of her thread painting. On the right then, as many of the scraps were, that were trimmed from the Statue of Liberty are layered over the silk in the detail. And this includes my first attempt at the Statue of Liberty's hand and torch displayed as proudly here as in New York Harbor. Next. Mr. Bartenbach's building presents a notable set of details from the oldest building or brick building as well in the, as, sorry, the oldest brick building as well as the first neon sign in my hometown. A friend was selling this building that his family had completed in 1882. Having this quilt, he said, enabled him to retain part of the building and his family's story after the sale. All but one of the keys that you see on the right-hand side that are stitched onto the quilt um, came from the drawer in his office. Next. Snail's pace brings our attention to the five pounds of buttons that cover the surface of this quilt. Employing a sense of humor, mother of pearl buttons were stitched down using a worm or wrapped stitch. Together they form snail trails, drawing the viewer's eye to the enormous snail with hand stitched rickrack and an old measuring tape, allowing it to inch along. This quilt symbolizes the beginning of my button collection. I've started collecting buttons and I have pulled from them to use, um, to connect all the panels on the right-hand side for pieces of entree or points of entree, sorry. Next. When a door closes, a window opens, is composed of pieces trimmed from recent quilts and reassembled to create a fanciful landscape. You will recognize the orange wall that was trimmed from Mr. Bartenbeck's building on the right side of this piece. And to the left of that is a brick wall. Of, to the left of the brick wall is a stone wall with an arch that was reconfigured from another quilt's trimmings. The scraps from the stones on the original quilt and this piece were layered on more shattered silk sitting near my ironing board years before it was heavily quilted, becoming part of the panel for points of entree on the right. 
when a door closes and a window opens was in a show and positioned so that when moving through the exhibit, you could see it before entering the room 30 feet away. I love to create pieces that tantalize the viewer and draw them closer to discover the secrets I've captured in my art. Next. Moving in for a closer view, Mind the Gap and Tea Time were made for the Sakwa Benefit Auctions in 2019 and 2020. Figuring out how to incorporate found and collected objects into my art is so thrilling for me. From the unexpected collection of garters to a handful of used tea bags, wooden utensils, and a scalloped edged cafe curtain, these items made the auction quilts the delights that I am pleased to share. Points of entree dis uh, pieces have also been, sorry, points of entree displays pieces that have been collected over time, including a rusted door strike. And I don't know if you can see it on this piece, but there's a little black safety pin that has been used after being bent as the hands of the clock on the clock face at the top of the right hand photograph and the face of a compass. Each are displayed in window openings cut into the silk and scrap quilted surface and filled with translucent tea bags. In this image, you can see many of the buttons and hooks that allow points of entree to be disassembled at any time. Finally, the next. Every upcycled, recycled, and reused piece of art has a story, even Olive's Bite, which commemorates the only block a bored young puppy happily destroyed with her enormous white teeth. Thank you for allowing me to join this select group of artists today. I hope that you will visit my website to view more of my art. And now I would like to introduce the amazing Laura Wazalowski. Thank you, Linda. And thank you everybody for coming today. It's so wonderful to be here with you. Thank you, Saka, for hosting us. And I'm Laura Wazalowski. I live in Elgin, Illinois, which is maybe 40 miles west of Chicago. And I'll show you my studio, and then I'm going to talk about my art a little bit. Next, please. So this is where I work. This is where I sew. This is the sewing room in the basement of my home. There on the left, you see the machine and the work tables and some of the storage areas. And there on the right is a waist height table where I make the artwork. And that's where I make my fused art quilts on that table right there. Next, please. And this is what it really looks like. It's a big mess. I have fabric scraps everywhere. I make fused artwork, so I have a lot of leftover scraps that I use to make more artwork. So if you see the table on the right, this is what it really looks like. It's covered with Teflon. So um, I can fuse, I can iron the shapes right on that tabletop. And then when they cool off, I can peel it off. The, I'm surrounded by these scraps of fabric in different colors. They all have glue on them. They all have fusible web on them. And I can take a piece and improvise with it and put it back. And I can, I spend a lot of time improvising and making things up from these scraps of fabrics. So you could call it recycling. I call it picking from a palette of colors. So next, please. And this is where I dye the fabric. This is my dye studio. This is on the other side of the wall of the sewing studio in the basement of our house. This is uh, also the family laundry room. And if you look at the, the slide on the right or the photo on the right, you see that there's the dyes on the shelf there that I'm going to be working with. Those are Procyon MX fiber reactive dyes. There's my washer and dryer and the laundry tubs. There's uh, that big table that you see with the fabric on it. That is my dye table. I call it the dye table. And again, it's waist high, it's covered in canvas and it has a little cushion to it. So I can use that table for all sorts of things. It measures maybe 
48 inches wide by 72 inches long. And I use it for fusing fabrics. There you see I'm fusing some silk fabric. I um, use it for dyeing, where I dye the fabrics and threads I make. And I use it for printing. I use it for silk screen work and for hand stamping things. So this table has been in my workshop for over 35 years and I have died there uh, for over 35 years. I've worked at this table for a long, long time. Next, please. And this is what I make on that table. I make hand-dyed threads and hand-dyed fabrics for my artwork and for sale in my company, Art Fabric. And I use this room all the time for washing out the threads, as you can see in the buckets there. I gather the water that's coming out of the washing machine while I'm washing fabric and I use that to rinse the thread. And eventually everything gets put back together and I end up with these wonderful bundles of threads and fabrics. The type of fusible web I use to answer someone's question is um, Wonder Under number 805 paperback fusible web from Pelham. So this is what I produce in this room. Next, please. And here I am, happy as a little bird, dyeing fabric. So on that table, every time I dye or I print something or I do silk screen work, I have a drop cloth down. And that drop cloth is uh, been pre it's been infused with soda ash. So I pre-soak the fabric in soda ash, which is the mordant for Procyon MX fiber reactive dyes. So if I should drop some dye on that fabric, it instantly reacts with the fabric and I don't have to worry about when I wash it out, I'm gonna have that intense color of that dye that I just dropped on the fabric. So the drop cloths are there to protect the surface of my table and to make something from them eventually. So here I am dyeing. And next, please. And this is what happens when you drop a lot of paint or a lot of dye on your drop cloths. You end up with beautiful drop cloths. This is called Painting the Town number three. And if you look at it, the background of this is one of those drop cloths. And at the time when I made this, I was painting a lot of fabric and practicing some stamps that I was designing. And my kids were at home at the time and they were practicing making stamps. So there's a lot of history with this background fabric. When I look at it, I remember what I was doing at that time. On top of the background fabric, which is a drop cloth, is a paintbrush. And that fabric that I made the paintbrush with is, was made on that drop cloth. So that shibori fabric was constructed, was dyed on that drop cloth and it became fused onto the background. And I stitched it with a very plain grid. Next, please. Now this drop cloth is a little different. I had been painting fabric with very, some silk scarves with very light valued um, dyes. And it sinks through, it sinks through the silk and it stains the drop cloth that's underneath. And I was also practicing with more hand stamping. So that drop cloth became a combination of those pale colors that I was working with and also some of the stamping that I was doing. And what I was stamping was a black and white fabric. So I put the, the I mean, I was stamping white fabric with black textile paint. So I put the fabric down and stamp a bunch of fabrics and whatever leaked over or leaked through became part of that drop cloth. Painting the town number two is fused. The paintbrush is fused on top of one of those drop cloths. And to me, it suggests that moment in time when I was making that those particular objects, the silk scarves, the stamps that I was carving and that hand printed fabric. Next, please. And this is the quilt that is in the exhibit. It's called Painting the Town Number One. This is the very first drop cloth quilt that I made with a paintbrush on it. Painting the Town Number One 
is a whole cloth quilt. It's all dyes and paints and um, stamping and roller printing, printing that I was doing. So the background of this, that yellow textile paint uh, came about because I was painting some paper and cardboard um, and fabrics for another Sackett exhibit called Radical Elements. And I was using a lot of yellow textile paint and it came through or went around the edges of the items that I was painting. So when I look at this, I remember that other quilt that I was making at the time. And I remember that I was printing fabrics with a roller. So if you look at the that kind of hashtag looking imprint on the fabric, that's made with a roller where I'm rolling on the ink onto a fabric and going over the edges. The handle of the brush is made with mono printing. So the brush is painted. It's painted directly onto that drop cloth. And I did mono printing for the paintbrush handle and for the ferrule and the, the sweep of the bristles, that's all painted on top of that background. And what I like is that the colors and the texture come through and you see them through that blue textile paint that I use to paint the paintbrush. So to me, the paintbrush represents that act of making art. And it's sort of an extension of my hands. And it represents that moment in time, that instant when you apply the paint or the dye to the fabric. It's that moment in time when you're creating. And the fabric behind it, that represents my history. That's my history of my creative process because I can read it like a book and it brings back all those memories of when I was making art. So in using the drop cloths and recycling them into art, I'm sort of celebrating the creative process that we all do. And this process, and I'm sure it does this for you too, this process of making gives you so much joy and it's so good for you. And I wanna thank Saka for having these wonderful exhibits so that I can show you what I'm making and help celebrate the creative process with you as well. And now back to Martha. Thank you. So um, I and the three live artists are gonna come back on so that we can ask them your questions. Um, we have 800 people today, which is just phenomenal, and a lot of great questions. I just want to say as on a personal note that I did, I curated an exhibition of works by master artists from my second book, Masters Art Quilts, and Laura was one of them, and her paintbrush piece was in that exhibition, and each time I gave a gallery walk, I carefully planned it out so that I ended with Laura's paintbrush, because for me, it is just evocative of the creative process, the way, as Laura said, and it was a great way to end a lecture about the wonderful art that was in that exhibition. So I, I've always been a fan of these paintbrush pieces. Um, but now we're going to go back to Carol, really a change of mood. Carol, a lot of the questions that came through thanked you for being willing to share your own, some of your own life through your art and to ask you, first of all, do you do pieces that are not issue pieces? Um, I did what I call pretty quilts for the first 10 years. Um, I did a lot of work that looked kind of like the kelp forest, a lot of movement and all that. And uh, in 2009, I decided to do an autobiographical body of work, um, which was called the Tall Girl Series, a body of work. And I enlisted the help of Marion Coleman to be my mentor because I was, it was such a deeply personal story that I had never talked about that I felt like I needed a little, somebody to prod me. And so that's how we became acquainted. Um, she's also a tall girl, so we talked about that a lot. Anyway, so um, the Tall Girl series was 25 pieces. Um, I landed four exhibits for it. It went out in the world. 
people started talking about it, asking me questions about it. And I just felt when I finished, like I couldn't go back to making pretty quilts. I felt like I had more things to talk about. And so from that um, body of work, Marion and I did the collaboration. We didn't actually collaborate. We were both doing um, works about important moments in our lives. And we were gonna collaborate on the final piece. Unfortunately, she became ill and passed away. And so we did not get to do that, but it has had two exhibits. It's been at the Visions Art Museum and um, at the LHUCA Louise Hopkins Underwood Center for the Arts in Lubbock. And we have a tentative exhibit for the Dairy Arts Center in uh, Colorado this year, but they're still closed because of the pandemic. So sure. I don't know if that answered the question. But yeah, no. It, it, I just keep finding exciting things to do work on narrative work. And um, I wanted to ask, and you don't have to answer if you're not comfortable. Does this piece in Upcycle about etiquette and pr how proper young ladies should look and behave connect in your mind with the Tall Girl series that you did? Oh yeah, I think the whole thing. My father was a corporate executive and you know, so there was this whole thing about how the family looked, being the perfect family. Um, you know, I, I didn't fit the I didn't fit the image of the perfect picture. And uh, so I think that it's all tied together. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of our audience were particularly moved that you shared that you had that you were raped while you were at college, you know, which I think um, obviously also plays into a lot of body image um, works that you have done. Right. Um, I was actually um, on to Defining Moments piece 13, um, had not made that piece when uh, Brock Turner um, the Stanford rapist when he was when the judge gave him a light sentence and it just it just ripped into me I had not talked about my rape I never reported it I was in college in Utah which you know immediately the victim is the, is the, the problem and um, so I decided to make that piece and I in, in interjected it between 11 and 13. Yeah well, well thank you for sharing it. Um, I, it I, well, that one was juried into Quilt National 17. And the hardest part about it was being interviewed by a young man who was probably eh, less than 30 and talking about my rape. And that was that was the hardest part of the whole thing. Sure. No, definitely. Thank you. Sure. Um, now we, you know, and then this is what I love about textile talks is that they we have so many different approaches to art. So Linda. Um, first of all, can you tell everybody what the name of your hometown is? Because not everybody caught that. I didn't give it. It's ah. Nebraska. Okay, so um, people wanted to know in your work, are you transferring photos and then thread painting? Or how are you creating your historical facades? Um, I use a variety of methods. I've used stenciling. Um, the, if you can remember back, the library on um, uh, in service to the public was actually crayon on white fabric. Oh. So it's, I use paint, I use um, applique, and actually every once in a while, I'll actually insert a photograph or, you know, embroidery or applique from the reverse. And it's just, every piece gets a new technique. The only mm -hmm. thing that's ever th been thread painted was the uh, Statue of Liberty. Okay, all right. Um, one of the things that I always want and you didn't show us is how large is your stash of vintage items <laughs> and buttons? And I know you post on Facebook your vintage Christmas cards and um, you seem to like to collect and preserve and then share things from our history. Um, I have been a collector since I was very young. The man that uh, our neighbor across the street that became my, my brother's godfather was the building inspector. So he would take us for trips 
on the weekend and show us all these old houses that have been condemned and then show us all the beautiful artwork and woodwork and everything that was going to be destroyed. And that's when I said, you know, I, there's no point in throwing things away. Combine that with a grandmother who, I mean, made my teddy bear when I was a year old out of an old coat of hers. You know, it's just, this is what I was brought up thinking. It's like preserve and keep. And I have two closets that are 11 feet tall, probably eight feet wide and seven feet deep that have drawers and, and shelves and this and that. And I use every cigar box I can find and fill them with all the stuff I collect. So how do you decide what you're gonna pull out to make into an art quilt? It, I have a discussion with myself. It could be six months, it could be just an hour, but the, the, it's the whole idea of how do I best answer the question? It's tea time was one that was the perfect example because I said, okay, if I'm going to do this, I should have like cameos from old ladies that I had cameo buttons and trim them around the side and make all this ornate and everything. And I was like, no, 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 no. And I finally just started making um, pojagi with the tea bags and doing the hand stitching and collecting them and sending, sewing them together and doing a drawing of the clock that I wanted. And I stitched that on and then I layered another layer of tea bags over the top and stitched it again. And so I was adding all this depth and everything. And then underneath all that, the thing you don't see is there's another piece of rayon that also came out of the obi that I found at the estate sale. So it's like, you know, it's just, it, it just builds on itself. And the story tells me what it wants to be. Mm -hmm. I just follow the rules. <laughs> No, I don't think there are very many rules. That's the wonderful thing. Yes. Um, Laura, everybody wants to thank you for showing the real studio. <laughs> and they want to know, how do you not get dye on your family's laundry? Oh, well, I didn't, I didn't say I don't get dye on my family. <laughs> um, we're pretty, I'm pretty, uh, let's put it this way. I'll, I dye for a week. And everybody knows that's what I'm doing every day. And they pretty much stay clear of it. And um, I keep things very clean. Um, I noticed in the chat, somebody was talking about how the, I use the water that comes out of the washer. I do that all the time. So if I'm, I dye the thread one day and the next day I'll dye the fabric. And then the next day or a few days later, I'll wash out the fabric and as I wash the fabric, I, I collect the water in buckets and use that to rinse the um, thread. Mm -hmm. So dyeing takes a lot of water. And I'm fortunate to live in you know, the Great Lakes region. So it's not that expensive for us. But I try to recycle that as much as I can and, and be as mindful of it as I can. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, we have had a few accidents probably. <laughs> Um, yeah, somebody else wanted to know about all the irons, and I assume that has a similar preventative function. Um, but what I wanted to ask you about your art is, so these um, paintbrush pieces um, go on your drop cloths. Um, how, what are your drop cloths made of? How often do you change them? And is this part of a larger series or they're just the three? Um, this is part of a larger series. Some of them are not, they're not, they don't have anything to do with paintbrushes, but they are drop cloths in the background. And I change them, you know, whenever I feel like it. When I feel like the, the uh, drop cloth has ripened, when it's at the right spot. <laughs> okay. I, I switch it around while I'm dying, I'll move it to a different spot so that it gets fairly well covered with dye or paint or whatever I'm doing. So I am mindful of what's going on with the drop cloth. I have, they're made out of cotton. They're all 100% cotton because the dye that I work with works best on cotton. Mm -hmm. And you said that you, you pre-treating your drop cloth so that the dye bonds with the cotton fabric while, when it drips. Yeah, over the exactly. Mm. Okay, yeah, no, that's great. And I, I think you should maybe talk a little bit about the fact that you are constantly using 
off cuts and bits and pieces and that actually part of your creative process is looking at what you have lying around. Yes. So when you saw that uh, fusing table in my in my sewing area, that that has the off cuts or the cutaway parts, the leftover parts that have odd shapes and those odd shapes, those little bits of fabric trigger my next design. So that's my method of design work for something small is that I look at the fabric shape and that triggers the idea and I build off of that idea using those same, those scraps. And it seems like the scraps never get, there's never any uh, fewer of them. They just keep <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure that's true for Linda too, who also is being inspired by the, the scraps. Um, and um, we are now just past the top of the hour. I know we missed a little bit at the beginning because of Zoom cutting out. So we didn't get to everybody's questions, but thank you so much for joining us. If you stay on the call, we're going to show you the rest of the exhibition again. So you can see some of the other pieces that were made upcycling things from people's homes and their studios. And if you are interested, the catalog for this exhibition showing all of the artwork along with the artist statements is available for sale through the Sakwa store. Um, please join us again next week for the next textile talk. I'm having a wonderful time learning so much about fiber art and I hope that you will join us. So here's the slideshow of the Upcycle exhibition. Thank you, all three artists.